Never mind your impossible burger, plants that bleed as though they were meat. That's just so yesterday. Now, lab-grown meat could be coming soon to a restaurant or a supermarket near you. Real meat, but no animal died or was even inconvenienced to bring it to you. Is it the way of the future or is it a monstrous misstep? Let's have a look. The figures behind the appetite of the human race for meat are staggering. 130 million chickens are slaughtered every day, 4 million pigs. By weight, 60% of the mammals on Earth are livestock, just 4% are wild animals. Are those just interesting facts or are they an indicator that we have a problem? Well, not everybody agrees, but plenty see it as a problem for two reasons. One is to do with wanting to avoid animal cruelty and the fact that something needs to die in order to provide our food. The other is to do with pollution and particularly with climate change. If societies are moving towards zero carbon economies, which they are, then the question around meat is one of the fault lines around that whole debate. Do we seek a zero carbon an economy that fits what people want or do we push people to settle for what best fits a zero carbon economy? Those who believe the former look at figures suggesting that meat, particularly beef and lamb, have the highest impact and try to work out how to reduce those emissions while keeping the beef and the lamb. Those who want the latter simply say that people should get used to the idea that they can't eat as much meat in the future Preferably none, although only a few argue for actually banning all meat consumption. The biggest argument for the former group is quite simply the fact that throughout human history, meat has been a highly prized foodstuff. It's one of the most nutritionally complete foods we can get. Almost every food culture celebrates it in many different ways. People are just not going to give it up. So you have to find a way to accommodate the human appetite for it if you're going to persuade people to go along with net zero programmes. Into that debate now is a completely new factor. The development of meat that is meat. It's not a vegetable burger that pretends to bleed blood. It's proper meat, but nothing died in order to produce it. You can call it fake meat or franken food if you're against it, or cultured meat or cell-based meat if you're positive towards it. Meat that is grown at a cellular level in a bioreactor. There was a landmark last week as the chicken nuggets produced by the US company Eat Just passed a first safety review in Singapore and will soon be sold at a restaurant there. When first sold, it'll be more expensive than standard chicken, but as production gets scaled up, it's expected that it will ultimately become cheaper. Eat Just's chicken is grown in a 1,200-litre bioreactor and then combined with plant-based ingredients. The cells used to start the process came from a cell bank, didn't involve the slaughter of any chicken because the cells can be taken from biopsies of live animals. Indeed, a promo video by Eat Just shows their team trying out eating some of their chicken while the chicken from which it was produced happily pecks around them as they do so. I don't know if that was actually true or if they just said that it was for the video, but it illustrated the point. It's a remarkable thing. Right now, the early batches of this chicken are not completely untainted from death, if you're going to put it that way, because the growing medium includes a fetal bovine serum, which is extracted from fetal blood. Yum! But this is mostly removed from the final product, and in future, a plant-based serum is going to be used instead. So for people who are perhaps vegetarians predominantly because of an ethical concern over the ending of life, these become viable products, you would think. They would also have some health benefits since they avoid issues of bacterial contamination and animal waste and the overuse of antibiotics and hormones in animals. The other intended benefit is that this manner of production will have a smaller impact on the environment than traditional meat rearing. So far, the studies have suggested that this would be true when you take into account various impacts. But while it avoids a lot of wastes and other forms of impacts and pollution, it does use more energy. So if it was going to go to scale, there's a significant impact there in creating the energy infrastructure to make the energy in a way that doesn't increase emissions from a power station rather than just from a farm. Which is all very well, but will people actually eat such products? Well, the market certainly thinks so, or at least they hope so. 
A recent report from the global consultancy AT Kearney predicted that by the year 2040, most meat consumed by people would not come from dead animals. That would be an astonishing turnaround in the space of 20 years, given the sort of volumes implied by that prediction. A.T. Kearney's Carsten Gerhardt said that he expected that cultured meat would replace cuts of traditional meat with burgers and sausages largely replaced by plant-based products. California-based Memphis Meats, which is one of the key startups in this space, closed a $161 million funding around the start of this year to build a new plant in the Bay Area. Israel's Future Meat Technologies is likewise investing in new facilities to start pushing the scale to get products onto the market in 2021. So the market certainly hopes so, but I ask it again, will people actually want to eat this product? There's a moment of possibility hanging in the air before society's quite made up its mind whether this is the way of the future or something really quite dystopian and kind of repulsive. If any group were likely to be up for it, you'd think it would be so-called Generation Z or Z if you're American, including people who are aged between 18 and 25. That's absolutely the age where you'd be expected to embrace new things as the way of the future, unlike crusties like me who mutter it's against the natural order of things. But a survey published in September in the journal Frontiers in Nutrition found that there was a distinct lack of enthusiasm from Generation Z for this new meat alternative, which was defined in the survey as lab-grown meat. Dr Diana Bugueva from the University of Sydney said, Our research has found that Generation Z, those aged between 18 and 25, are concerned about the environment and animal welfare, yet most are not ready to accept cultured meat and view it with disgust. Disgust is probably not what you want in a new product. Part of this apparently comes down to marketing and particularly what you call it. In the survey, it was referred to as lab-grown, which apparently is a turn-off name, as is something like fake meat. In market research, they identified that cultured meat and then, to a lesser degree, cell-based meat were the two labels that got the best response, which is why you'll see them used the most in the future. Because it does seem winnable, other consumer studies found a higher rate of acceptance when the product was referred to as cultured meat or cell-based meat and more information was given about it. Now, the danger with a product that needs to be explained before it's accepted is that it's entirely open to being hijacked with a popular campaign that fills in that information gap. So some campaigners seeking to attach the Frankenfood label to it and filling in the information gap with their own spin, that would probably do it. In the age of conspiracy theories, it won't be long before someone's spreading lively stories about it. It would only take one article about it on the World Economic Forum website, for instance, for someone to be claiming that it's all part of a new world order. But anyway, it seems to me there are two routes where cultured meat can gain acceptance and scale in modern society. One will be that it will grow to fill the niche in low price processed products sold generally to poorer consumers who are not that much bothered about the provenance of their food. Processed meats, cheap ready meals, pet foods, all of that sort of stuff. Once the scale has made it cheaper than standard meat, it'll be a no-brainer for corporations to start using it as the standard kind of invisible meat component of their dishes. Maybe some countries will insist that such sources will need to be labelled, but it's exactly the consumer group that doesn't really spend much time reading labels and doesn't particularly worry about those sorts of things too much. And of course, once it's widely consumed in that regard, psychological barriers to it emerging in other places begin to get lower as well. The second route to acceptance would come by playing to the premium end. So I'm a foodie. I might be really keen to try some of the best beef in the world, Wagyu beef. Unfortunately for me, it costs $200 per pound. It can be up to $300 for a steak. But if you're gonna grow cultured meat from a single cell, why not make it a single cell of the very finest animals? Supposing you can offer me that Wagyu beef steak to all intents and purposes, the same as a version you'd overspend on today, but for the same price as a standard steak. If I'm in a restaurant and I can choose either steak and they're both at roughly the same price, do you think I might be interested to go for the cultured Wagyu steak? I think I might. 
How about if I could have French breast chicken instead of standard chicken? Again, tempting, could be. It'll certainly be highly appealing when it comes to seafood. One startup is already aiming to grow sushi-grade salmon as a cultured fish. If that could be done successfully, that would have another element of popularity since mass-produced salmon has a recurring problem with parasites that may be at the back of the mind of people eating them raw in sushi today. But then, of course, one of the earliest targets for cultured fish would be endangered species. Supposing you could put bluefin tuna back on the menu without anyone protesting because you're not actually taking anything out of the ocean. Sounds like something that would be worth pursuing. I mean, just saying it doesn't make it easy. The startup working on salmon did a taste test for employees, investors and a group of chefs and restaurateurs. The product scored high marks for its realistic texture of the fish, but not great marks for flavour, which was described as lacking. Which is not what you want, especially in the early stage, when every scrap is enormously expensive to produce. So with those sorts of problems, you can see why we end up starting with chicken. Chicken... Very basic product, the cultured meat version tastes like chicken. It's eaten in large quantities worldwide, often in processed forms such as chicken nuggets where people aren't much going to notice a huge difference. So then another question that arises is this. Will you get lots of vegetarians and vegans moving to it? It seems unlikely and it's not what the various startups see as the target market for their products. One opinion piece in The Guardian gives a foretaste of a discussion. What's the point of lab-grown meat when we could simply eat more vegetables? Well, most people don't want to stop eating meat and just eat vegetables. But not everyone's willing to accept such a basic observation of a world in which we live. So we get this. The corporate race for cultured protein rests on a view of human beings as greedy and incapable of change. Greedy and incapable of change. It gives you some sense of the moral judgment level that the real true believers will bring to this discussion. Because, of course, ultimately, lifestyle choices are generally an expression of identity, not wholly rational evaluation of the right habits to suit a particular moral code. So those people won't want to accept an industrial scale product produced inevitably by large corporations. Cultured meat is eye-catching technology, but it is also an over-engineered solution to a problem that we can solve by changing our diets. If we simply stopped eating meat or ate it far less often, then there would be no need for either harmful intensive animal agriculture or meat grown in a lab. The writer's main objection to the technology is that once it gets pushed to scale, then it means it's produced by big corporations aiming to make a profit, which they think is self-evidently a bad thing. But it's exactly what you would expect and need if you're seriously going to seek to push something to meet the protein needs of 8 billion people worldwide. Wide. But if you want a real ick factor, there's one last twist in the tale. Oh yes, the Ouroboros steak. The Ouroboros steak is named after the ancient symbol of the snake eating its own tail. Do you see where this is going? A group of American scientists and designers have developed a concept for a grow your own steak kit using human cells and blood to question the ethics of the cultured meat industry. The steaks could be grown by the diner at home using their own cells which are harvested from inside their cheek. Said one of the creators, people think that eating oneself is cannibalism, which technically this is not. Our design is scientifically and economically feasible, but also ironic in many ways. We are not promoting eating ourselves as a realistic solution that will fix human protein needs. We rather ask a question. What would be the sacrifices we need to make to be able to keep consuming meat at the pace that we are? In the future, who will be able to afford animal meat and who may have no other option than culturing meat from themselves? Listen to me, Hatcher. You gotta tell them, silent breed is people! We need to eat the babies! Hmm, thanks for the thought. We'll get back to you on that one. Okay, here's my take on this. I think there's clearly a role for this in the mix of things we will do. As I've said before on here, I think people will be eating meat 
for many decades to come. There's lots of scope for improving the efficiency of how standard traditional meat is produced. There will remain a demand for premium meats where breeding and keeping adds to the quality of the product, but there's also a vast quantity of relatively low-grade meat consumed across the world, and it's feasible that this would provide one source for that amongst others. Keeping animals is one of the ways the poorest people in the world survive. I don't think that can or should be replaced in the short term by something like this. It won't please the vegans or the environmentalists much, but there's going to be a lot of hard work done over the coming decades to make standard meat production more efficient. And I think that's where the bulk of the effort is going to and should go. But cultured meat may well become a thing alongside that. Ultimately, it should be allowed to grow and improve as a product. And if it gets to the point where its desirable attributes make it the food of choice for the wider population, then you could see that bigger transformation starting to happen. I don't think that's going to happen in my lifetime because it's the sort of thing that would take a number of generations before people fully accept it as normal. But you can see that once you do get to the stage where more than 50% of the meat that people eat is from sources where nothing had to die in order to create it, the arguments on an ethical basis for shifting the other half will become very much more powerful. Will I try it when I come across it? Sure. Why not? I'll try anything. Almost. Not going for the eat your own face burgers. 